Hello, Corruptors and compatriots. My name is TB Skyn, and there's a new short story out, or a long short story, which I think makes it a medium story for League of Legends, specifically for the um, Odyssey alternate universe that was recently introduced with a bunch of skins. Did a full video breakdown of the animated trailer, and you can find that on my channel. It's the previous video if you're interested in that. Otherwise, here's a very, very long video where we deep dive into the writing of the story. Now, I've done this once before um, with the eye in the depths Eye in the Deep, I think, the, the story about the Watchers that came out in conjunction with the Freljord event. And the way that these videos go, just so that we're clear on it from the start, is I'm going to read through the story. Like, just, like, literally just read it out as though I'm doing an audiobook. But then every single time something bothers me, or I find a, a thing I want to nitpick on, or a thing I want to critique or talk about, a certain thing that the writer does in order to make the story do a thing... I'm going to stop and I'm going to start talking about that and I'm going to explain it. So what's going to be happening is that it's going to take us like 15, 20 minutes to get through the first few paragraphs. And then as we go on, slowly we'll go faster and faster because I'm going to have exhausted a lot of the topics that I want to talk about. But point of me bringing this up is if you want to know what the story says, you can stick around. We'll get through it together. Um, but the thing that would probably be a lot smarter would be to go and read the story for yourself and then come back and we can have a discussion about like the techniques that the writer uses, how the writer achieves what they want to do, what the story tries to do, how well it manages to do it, and all that good stuff. So this is like essentially kind of like a live editing session where I go through the story, I talk about all the things that I think like you could change, you could make better, the things that you could tighten up, the things that you could erase, the things that you could add. Um, and this is not... Um, Specifically me being, ah, I'm a much better writer than the person who wrote this. I know how he should have done it. Oh, what a garbage person. This is not like a put-down thing. This is not a, an attempt to attack the writing. It's a discussion of, okay, so how would I have done it? How, how do I think it could be improved? And the point is that you take this criticism on board and you add it to your own thinking. You go, okay, does that argument hold any merit for stuff that I'm writing or other pieces of writing that I'm reading? But it's not a question of me correcting mistakes. It's not a question of me pointing out things that are obviously wrong and laughing at them because, oh, oh the incompetent hacks at Riot Games don't know how to write a thing. That's that's not what's going on here, and I really don't want it to be interpreted this way. It's it's a live feedback editing session. I might, might very well be wrong about a lot of things, but the point is that in considering whether my argument is correct, you are thinking critically about the writing. So, that's a whole lot of preamble, just in order to get to the story. The story is called The Lore by Dan Abnett, and it focuses specifically around Cain in his Odyssey Universe incarnation, where he is an Imperial soldier, a very high-ranking Imperial soldier and administrator and advisor, who travels to a backwater planet and finds something. Now, I'm just gonna say the spoilers, he finds Rast, he finds the Scythe. Um, now, in his base universe skin, he has a kind of equal relationship with Rast, the Scythe. Like, when when Kane in vanilla League of Legends lore, runs around with a darkened Scythe, he's having an equal struggle with it for control over himself and his body. And if he wins that struggle, he becomes the Shadow Assassin and gains one set of powers. If he loses, Rost takes over and starts doing his killing and reaping. This is not the case in this version of the universe. Here, as if you if you have played Kane in game, or if you've seen the special interactions video by Skin Spotlights, and I'll link that down below, what happens here even if Cain wins, air quotes, the struggle with Rast and assumes Rast's power for himself, he doesn't become an ascended shadow assassin. Things don't go well for him. He becomes corrupted. He falls apart. His mind is destroyed in an instant. And he becomes a raving lunatic with power enough, you know, to destroy a small planet at his fingertips, which is a very, very bad thing. And the reason I know that is because um, the writer of Cheetah Cain in this version of him was tweeting about it, Jared Rose, and I'm going to link to some of his tweets down below as well, where he talks about how this is not a situation where Cain can win. There's no winning. Either he gets taken over by Rast, or else he takes over Rast's power and becomes completely fucking bonkers in the process. Either way, this is a story about corruption. And this is the origin story of Cain, the story of who he was before he picked up the scythe in this universe, before he ran into Rast, before he suffered this corruption that will inevitably end poorly for him, no matter what the outcome of his particular struggle with the weapon. All of this is preamble, um, which is necessary because the whole story is structured around leading up to this point. The whole point of the story as it is, is to show us 
the loss, the tragedy of Cain. I, to, to show us what was lost when he gained this power. Like all the parts of him that went away when he became obsessed with this scythe. This is the tragedy of the story. This is the point of the backstory, is to show that Cain wasn't just an irredeemable monster from the start. Terrible things happened that turned him into something that he didn't necessarily used to be. And this comes into play from the very first paragraphs, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. Let's actually start, like, five minutes into this thing, let's actually start reading the story. Kilo always yelled, cried, surprise, when he attacked. Kane supposed it was the equivalent of Kilo pulling his punches out of respect, or perhaps some artifact of his ancient preset protocols. The warning cry was never necessary, nor what is especially amusing after all this time. And a three-quarter ton fight mech shouting surprise as it swung it a hook-handled titanium halberd with a 50 centimeter blade edge at your head was still a three-quarter ton fight mech swinging a hook-handled titanium halberd with a 50 centimeter blade edge at your head. <gasps> so, here we come to our first nitpick. Strap yourselves in, boys. It's gonna be a long video. So, we begin in media's rest. That is, we begin in the middle of the action. There is no um, setup, there's no preamble, there's no introduction, there's no, ah, yes, the uh, twin suns were low in the sky when they set out from the X planet and traveled through hyperspace. There's really no introduction. We aren't told who the characters are, where we are, what the situation is, what are the stakes, what's going on. We're just told that Kilo always cried surprise when he attacked. Someone attacks. That's literally the first thing that happens. And then we get a period of reflection. Now, the trouble with Media's rest, or rather, let's talk about the things that that approach solves. Because when you have a very involved universe, like a fantasy universe or a sci-fi universe of some kind, then in order for the audience to understand that universe, necessarily you're gonna have to do a lot of world building in order to make that world seem real, to make it seem plausible, like a place that characters actually live in. But in order to do that, you have to explain a bunch of stuff, like how do they travel at hyperspeed through, like, like at light speed through the galaxy? How do they travel past the light barrier, which is otherwise unbreakable? They have to have some kind of special technology for that. Who's like, who's the major powers in the galaxy? Like, is are, is there an empire? Is there a republic? What's going on? And like, what's what's the economy like? And how do they power their things? And what's their energy? So like, this all this stuff that kind of needs to be there in order for a universe to be believable. So the thing that you can really get screwed on is if you spend the first 30 pages of your story just explaining all that shit. Because that's only gonna be interesting to people who are super interested in hypothetical um, sci-fi universes and how they specifically work. It's stuff that the audience eventually is gonna need to know, but front-loading it can be a really big mistake because then eventually the audience is like, holy shit, I've been reading 20 pages and nothing has happened yet, I'm bored, and gonna go do something else. The other side of that coin, or the other side of that spectrum, is in media's rest. You explain nothing. Like, there's no setup, no preamble, we have no fucking idea what's going on. Just dump us in the middle of the action and have us pick it up as we go along. This is a good approach in, in order to avoid, like, because think of a, a movie like Star Wars. Every single goddamn Star Wars movie, the first thing that happens is the opening crawl, where we get all that exposition, all that preamble about, oh, the Empire, so, so, and the Princess Leia, blah, 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 leading with... The Rebellion, yada yada, all that preamble is done at the start. And the only reason Star Wars gets away with doing that, by the way, is because... Well, first of all, because it's a callback to 1950s adventure serials, which is the thing that, that Lucas was trying to recreate with Star Wars specifically, but also because they have the Star Wars theme. Like, really, that's... My opinion on Star Wars is that the only fucking reason those movies get away with having the opening crawl... First of all, it's because they're Star Wars movies and they have to have the opening crawl because that's expected, but also because they have the John Williams theme. Like, because I would I would read the phone book to the George Williams theme for Star Wars. Da, 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 da. I just sit and listen to that. I'm perfectly happy there. You can't do that in a story. You can't have a soundtrack to a book or indeed a short story. So, for a sci-fi universe, you have to come up with something else. All of this in order to say, when you start in media's rest, when you start in the middle of the action... The idea is to immediately hook the audience in, to get them curious, to get them excited. Like, I have no idea what's going on, but it seems exciting. I want to know more. I want to know why is Kilo yelling surprise when he attacks? Why is he attacking this guy, Kane? And, and why is he doing it with a hook-handled titanium halberd with a 50-centimeter blade edge? And why is he see a quarter, three-quarters on fight make? All these questions are established right away. And the audience is hooked in by the expectation that they will find answers to those questions and that those answers will be satisfying and interesting. 
So finally, after 10 minutes, we get to my first nitpick of the story. This is a joke. Which, by which I don't mean that derisively, this is a joke. It's a, it's a repetition joke. It's a, oh, a, a, the warning cry was necess never necessary, nor would it especially amusing after all this time. A three-quarter ton fight mech shouting surprise as it swung a hook-handled titanium halberd with a 50 centimeter blade edge at your head <gasps> was still a three-quarter ton fight mech swinging a hook-handled titanium halberd with a 50 centimeter blade edge at your head, right? So it's a repetition joke where, oh yeah, it's like, doesn't matter what he shouts, it's still a big thing swinging a dangerous thing at you. Here's the trouble with this. I have no idea what the context for that joke is yet. In order for this to be either interesting or funny, I need to understand the stakes of the situation. Like, this is literally... Every joke needs a setup before you can do the punchline, and this is putting the punchline before the setup, because in order for this joke to be remotely funny, or in order for me to understand how to interpret the situation, I need to know who the characters are, what their relationship is, and why the thing that's happening is happening. This is something that comes later. Later on, I understand that this is like a ritual that Kane and Kilo have. By the way, you should really just go and read the story yourself first. <laughs> uh, did I already say that? I don't know if I said that. I got into this really quickly. I don't know who Kane and Kilo are in the story at this point. I don't know what their relationship is. I don't know, like, Kilo clearly has attacked Kane before, and he's obviously also actually trying to kill him, so am I to understand that Kane is in peril right now? Like, that he's actually in danger? Or that this is just a kind of funny haha -ha situation where I don't have to worry, there are no stakes, there is no trouble. That's kind of the problem, because the, 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 the meat of the joke is that it's a quarter-ton fight mech swinging a hook-handled titanium halberd with a 50 centimeter blade edge. That is a really deadly dangerous thing being swung by a really big and powerful opponent coming at Kane. But unless I understand whether Kane is in actual danger or if this is just a funny, funny little skit, I don't know whether to find that joke funny or whether to go, holy shit, he's in danger, right? And that is putting the punchline kind of before the setup, which is, again, the problem with In Medias Res is that you don't, you can't establish any of that ahead of time. You have to go, just go with it, and if it doesn't land, as this joke does not land with me, it kind of takes the, the, the punch out of it. And the other problem is, we start In Medias Res, we start in the middle of the action, right? So the thing you want from that is for there to be action. Unfortunately... We start with action, Kilo always yells surprise when he attacks, then all of a sudden we have Kane reflecting on Kilo attacking him, then we have a little bit of backstory about, oh, the warning cry was never necessary, it wasn't especially amusing, and then we have an extended description of the manner in which the thing is attacking, what the thing is, and what is it what it is attacking with. And then we get back into something actually happening, which is Kane going, oh, not now. Kane side. Like, and that's Again, if you're gonna start on action, 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 yeah, exciting things, <laughs> things being attacked and ah, a surprise, then you can't just immediately go like, slow the whole thing down and have a long banter session in the middle of that. You have to keep the momentum going. And that's, a, ah, that's 30 minutes and I have managed my first nitpick. Yeah, this is gonna be a long one. Not now, Kane sighed. But I have surprised you, said Kilo dolefully. He looked down at Kane's onyx desk, now split cleanly in two pieces and lying on the floor. Then he looked at Shida Kane himself, who was still in his seat, reading an official communique, and not even remotely split into two pieces. Another jokey joke that we don't un quite understand yet what the context is. I wouldn't start with that. I, l I really wouldn't open with it. Kilo narrowed his optics in confusion, and waved a huge metal paw through Kane's form. Form? Body? Okay. The image rippled. A hollow lure. Yes, said Kane from the other side of the chamber. A hollow lure. This was a trick. Uh-huh. You have tricked me. I heard you coming four decks away, Kane replied. He occupied the chamber's window seat. Beyond the thick tinted port, the hard neon lines of sling space rasped by. Kane was reading the document intently. His pose and activity exactly matched the hologram figure in the chair. Kilo looked from one to the other. A hollow lure is clever, he said. But how did you hear me coming? I was stealth moded. Okay, another little nitpick. This one is not going to take 10 minutes, I promise. When you have, like I said, when you have this hard sci-fi universe, you have to do the world building as you go. 
Like, you, you can't, you don't have the preamble, so you can have to just skim over some stuff and rely on the audience, first of all, understanding sci-fi tropes in order to sort of figure out what's going on. And you have to rely on them to be okay with not knowing what certain things are. For example, we don't know what sling space is. Now, we can infer that it is the method by which they are traveling faster than light, as you do in pretty much all fantasy sci-fi things, like is, is their version of hyperspace, but we don't know what sling space is. Like, is sling space like a special thing? Like they're going to a special alternate dimension, or is it, are they being slung somewhere? Is that why it's called sling space? We don't know what that is. And so when you see a terminology like that that you don't know and you don't understand, you go with your best understanding of it, and you kind of file it away in the back of your head, waiting for someone to explain it to you, waiting for someone to give you some kind of, not not necessarily a full, like, 12-paragraph explanation of all the physics and stuff, but someone to give you some kind of workable explanation for what the hell sling space is and how it works. Th there's no problem with this right here. The trouble is, you have to be very careful about how many new concepts you feed your audience before you explain them. That is to say, if you get like a whole ton, not just sling space, but you get hollow lore and you get fight mech and you get a ton and uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of in-universe terminology thrown at you, what's going to happen is your brain is going to start to get saturated and it's going to start to have trouble remembering them and it's going to start to have trouble filtering them. Sling space is probably important because it is the method by which they travel faster than light. That is a foundational aspect of pretty much any sci-fi story is to have some concept of how faster than light travel is achieved in order for a, a galactic empire of any kind to be even feasible. But the more special terminology you throw at people, um the more space they have to make in their head for remembering things that they expect to have explained to them later. Like, you're, if you're setting something up, you need to pay it off in some way somewhere down the line. This story does a really good job of this, by the way. This is this is why I'm bringing it up, is that this story does a really good job of spacing these things out, of being very careful not to overload the audience with way too much in-universe terminology. But if you want to see one where it goes wrong, like where it goes really badly wrong, Jinx had a lore update. Uh, a couple of years back now, I think, where they gave her a new color story, I think it was, where like she was rampaging through Son or something like that. And that story is just packed. It's just full of in-universe technology. Like, there's so fucking much of it. All these special words that only exist in Son that are just kind of thrown in there and never explained. And I got very annoyed by that story because it did a terrible job of pacing it out and of filtering the stuff that's important. That's the other thing. This is the format of the story, is that it's a short story. That is, it's a, it's a rather long short story to be sure, but it's still a short story. You can't do a full exploration of every aspect of the universe. You have to focus on something. And the thing they choose to focus on is Kane, specifically his mini story of coming to the scythe and picking it up. And so you can only do so much world building. You can only world build for things that are going to be relevant to this story. That is to say, it might be interesting to talk about the economics of the Demoxian Empire and how it all works and how it's all fit together and what's the administration structure and like how are they organized and like what's the trade system like and what's the culture like on the home world and stuff like that. All these interesting world building details might be fun to learn at some point, but they're not relevant to this story. And this story does a really, like, again, in contrast to some of the other work that Riot has done, this story does a really good job of focusing on the aspects of the universe that are relevant to the thing that is happening. And it's something I see a lot in fantasy fiction and in, in, in sci-fi fiction especially, is a writer who has all these great ideas for a universe. Like, oh, all these cool ver versions of, okay, this is how the military is organized, and this, this is how all these cool world-building details are working, and I've, I'm so excited about them, I just want to put them in there. And they don't pace them out correctly. They, they, sh they shove some really interesting world-building detail in at a point in the storyline where it's not relevant, and it's not going to become relevant for a very long time, or it's not going to be relevant at all, and that just kind of bloats the story, and for me at least, most of the time doesn't do anything to enhance it, it just kind of detracts from it, because the writer kind of disappears up their own butthole, sort of sniff, sn uh, drinking their own Kool-Aid about how cool their universe is, and neglecting the thing that's actually interesting, which is the characters, at least to me. So this story does a very good job of that, so like, if you're looking for a model for how to structure something like this, this, is, this story is a good thing to read. Anyway, I heard you coming four decks away, Kane replied. He occupied the chamber's window seat. 
Beyond the thick tinted port, the hard neon lines of sling space rasped by. Kane was reading the document intently. His pose and activity exactly matched the hologram figure in the chair. Kilo looked from one to the other. A hollow lure is clever, he said. But how did you hear me coming? I was stealth moded. Kane did not look up from his work. Figure of speech. I put a tracer on you last week. I've been mapping your movements, he said distractedly. The fight mech paused, then twisted awkwardly to look at himself, trying to find the tracer, like a dog trying to examine its own tail. That's not very sporting, he grumbled. You win a fight by any means at your disposal, said Kane, rising to his feet. He was a tall man, lean and lithe, clad in the black suit of an imperial officer. But he wore no pins or insignia, just plain black, indicating the highest status of all. His long mane of hair was shaved away from the side of his head in the style of the core world nobility, and a polished gold interface of ornate design covered his left eye and cheek. He looked at the fight mech. You taught me that. First lesson. So, the description of Kane. Notice something specific about the ways the characters are handled in this story. Kane gets a substantial introduction, like really just outlining exactly how he looks, exactly how he dresses, like he's got a long mane of hair shaved on one side of the head. All of that is information we could just kind of get from here, because, yeah, but the reason why this is here is because he's the main character, he's important, it's important that we know who he is, what he looks like, what he feels like, it's important we have a strong mental image of him for the story to go ahead. What doesn't happen at any point in the story, Kilo doesn't get a description. We know he's a three-quarter ton fight mech, but we don't know what a fight mech is, we don't know how they work or how we're supposed to picture it because he's not as important to the story as Kane. Again, this is something I think this story handles quite well. It doesn't spend a whole lot of time introducing characters that aren't going to be that important to the story. We may come back to this later on. Kilo shrugged. I suppose. So the lore was entirely fair. But, said Kilo, how will you learn if you cheat? Humans learn through action response. If you know I'm coming, you... Kane looked the fight mech in the eyes. Kilo, he said, my good and old friend Kilo. Do you really think I have anything left to learn? Kilo's huge and scarred bulk, heavy with green and orange ballistic plates, sagged slightly. See, here we get a little bit of... Okay, he's heavy with green and orange ballistic plate, but again, no substantial description of what he looks like. I suppose not. I suppose you are now the High Lord of the Empire and proven in battle. I suppose you are now one of the Emperor's own ordinals. I suppose there's nothing a rusty old fight mech can teach you now. I suppose it's the scrap heap for me, or grot work in the Betlam mines. Kilo. I suppose I might get my servos melted down for transuranics, or they could donate parts of me to younger fight mechs. Kilo. Kane strode up to the big machine. No supposing, and no feeling sorry for yourself, okay? I still need to maintain my edge. I need you to keep me on my toes. A surprise here, a surprise there, just like always. Kilo's uptake swiveled up, hopefully. Yes? Yes. How can an ordinal keep in prime form without his loyal fight mech to test him? Oh, you won this bout? Kilo asked. Well, you did cut my desk in half, so we'll call it even. Kilo nodded. He shuffled around and emitted a subsonic pulse that opened the arsenal suite built into the wall of Kane's quarters. The lacquered black panels slid aside, revealing racks of blade and projectile weapons bathed in a red glow. Every design under the many suns, and some so exotic that they had never seen sunlight at all. This is a good detail. Um, some so exotic they had never seen sunlight at all indicates, oh, they might be assassination weapons, then ooh. Tells us something about who Kane is without going into detail about, oh, he does assassination work as well. We will spar now, said Kilo. Select your weapon. Not today, but it is the scheduled time. Something's come up that requires my attention, said Kane, gesturing with a communique in his hand. A message? You were reading that when I came in. Which is why I didn't really want the interruption, said Kane. We'll need to reroute. Sling course is set for... I know. I'm changing that. The Emperor awaits your return to the Amada, the fight met said, to report on the Cloa policing action. This is too important. Nakuri has found something on an edge world, out past the Ryan Cluster. I am sure Commander Nakuri can deal with it, Kilo objected. He is a first-class officer of the Namaxian Empire, a decorated... Commander Nakuri is an old friend and comrade in arms, said Kane. I respect his judgment, and if he says something requires the direct attention of an ordinal, then I trust him. Inform Captain Vassar, I need her to reset our course. Kilo hesitated. Go on, said Kane. The fight mech nodded and began to clomp towards the exit. Wait, Kane called after him. He walked over to the big machine and pulled a tech fleck off the fight mech's broad back. Again, tech fleck. Introducing terminology to the story. This particular one doesn't come up again. We don't know what tech fleck is. Is it... Is, is it like a fleck... Of, it, it's a little dust mote that's made of 
I, it's not explained and it doesn't become relevant to the story. And that's where, as if I was editing the story, I'd be like, take that out. Like, that doesn't really matter. It's just, you're just asking the audience to reserve another little spot in the back of their head for terminology that you're not going to explain. Anyway, otherwise the story does a decent job of it. That's the tracer gone. See? All gone. You can surprise me again later. Okay, said Kilo. Renewed enthusiasm glowed in his optics. I got this special mallet I've been wanting to... Shh, 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 Kane silenced him. It's a surprise, remember? So, Kilo. As a character in this story, he's actually more important um, than the story lets on for most of it. Kilo only appears in this little opening section at first. He is not part of the vast majority of the story. He acts as a kind of a watermark to explain to us something about who Kane is at this point in time, which is he is a no-nonsense kind of all business, all duty person who's got, who's very willful, who will d disobey a direct order in order to go do something else that he deems to be more important than the direct order. But he's also someone who has sympathy for an old fight robot that has been trying to kill him for like probably 20 years or something like that. He's someone who has who has some affection for him, some sympathy, some affection, and just a little bit of of you know. Who, who demonstrates a little bit of kindness towards him, a little bit of mercy. Like he takes he takes away the tracker, and he's like, "You can you can you can try and kill me later, buddy. We'll still have fun, even though I'm all grown up. We can still have fun." He kind of treats him like his old dad or something like that. They kind of have that sort of relationship. I do wish so much of this opening segment hadn't been dedicated to um, Kane and Kilo essentially having an argument rather than building a positive relationship because later on in the story the way Kane responds to Kilo later is going to be sort of it's a, like I said it's a watermark it's going to demonstrate how much of a change has come to his character that later on he has a very different response to Kilo than the one he has in the opening where he has this affectionate relationship with him later on that's going to have changed and Kilo as a character therefore acts as a barometer to tell us how much Kane has changed for, from who he used to be by the end of the story. And that's why I wish some of all this arguing over where Kane should be going and the direct order and stuff had been moved to another section of the story, and the section with Kilo had just been completely focused on establishing the positive relationship between the two, because that would have made, like, the, the, the twist that comes at the end of the story would have been much stronger than anyway. Alone again, Kane woke the Astral Portolan unit. Again, Astral Portolan unit. Not a terminology I'm familiar with. It's something I'd like to have explained to me. As far as I remember, it's not going to happen in this story. In fact, I know it's not going to happen in this story. The console rose from the deck, opening its steel pedals to project a tri-dimensional, just say three-dimensional, local system chart into the air. This is one of my nitpicks. One of my personal annoyances is if you have a, an ordinary, understandable... English word that can tell you exactly the same as some kind of fancy tri-dimensional, like some, as some kind of special in-universe in terminology. Use the common English one, because it makes it a lot easier to read the story, at least for me. He reached out and rotated the image, moving through stars, selecting and enlarging. A swipe of his fingers brought Io Ionan, <laughs> reference to Ionia there, into view. His golden ocular interface in engaged with the projection and augmented it to a real-time real display of exquisite detail. Yeah, okay, fine. Ionan was an edge world, a nothing place, unpromising. Nakuri's team had been out that way for months, hunting for Aura, or for renegade Templars trying to steal that vital and precious power source from under Imperial noses. Here's a clever bit of world-building. Aura is an incredibly important thing to the Odyssey universe. It's like, it's it's the primary magical space resource that powers everything. It's essentially, it's like unobtainium from Avatar or whatever. Like, it's this magical resource that enables faster than light travel. It enables the Empire to be the Empire at all and all that stuff. So it's incredibly important to the world building of the story. But for the purposes of this story, it is never really explained that much more than it's a vital and precious power source because it's not necessary to this story to explain in detail what Aura is, where it came from, how it works. All of that isn't really re relevant to this story, and so the writer wisely refrains from doing it. The Demaxian Empire, operating out of the vast Locus Amata, was the supreme authority in known space. Its power, influence, and technological prowess were such that none could stand against it. There were no more wars. In the name of the Emperor, forces under the Ordinals and the Generals maintained absolute control. 
except that space, however well pacified, was very, very large. Moreover, it was annoyingly full of species and rogues who fought on anyway, resisting that control. No matter the size and military might of the Empire, which quite eclipsed any other power, subversive, be subversive behavior, subversive, why can't I say that word right now? Subversive behavior was persistent. The Emperor, Jarvan IV, was a good man. Indeed, his great-grandfather had been the first human to wear the crown. He and Cain were close in both age and friendship. In private, Jarvan had confided to his friend that he disliked the way imperial policy had been forced to become less tolerant in recent years. The Empire was seen as a monolithic force, unyielding and authoritarian. It was, to many, especially the outliers, the subjugated, the Templars, the notorious criminal wedges of the Syndicate, good lord, cut that sentence down a bit, a domineering and oppressive thing to kick against. This perception made Jarvan sad. He had come to the Crown with a heart full of progressive ideas and hopes. Instead, he'd been forced to implement tighter restrictions. I always thought... Kane had told him that holding on to this society would be harder than winning it. War is simple. Peace is harder. This is important, by the way. This is an important sentence to keep in mind for the characterization of Kane before he picks up the scythe, is that he actually cares about holding together a society. He cares about making peace in the Empire, even if the rest of him is not, you know, um, exactly... A democratic dream, there is this sympathetic core to him that he, he actually does care about this stuff. It pains me, Shida, Jarvan had replied. No one seems to respect, respect the great work we are doing. I'm really having trouble speaking today, aren't I? The future we represent. There's always someone squirming to evade us, to disobey. Like herding cats. Cats? Kane smiled at the memory. Cats, my emperor. A feline species. Infamously willful. So this tells us a little bit something about these guys aren't from Earth, right? They're, they're not... The Emperor Jarvan, despite being human, has no memory of cats, which are kind of a prevalent animal you would imagine on planet Earth. He doesn't know about it. That tells us, that's a little, that's a ni nice little detail that tells us something about the state of this universe is that don't expect to see planet Earth ever. Of course, the problem was aura. The substance, like liquid gold, was a source of vast, almost mythical power. Whoever wielded it successfully could have great influence, which meant that it was essential that the Empire controlled its sources, distribution, and use. Especially illegal were the biohacking purposes it could be put to, techniques practiced by the damnable Templars. Such behavior was dangerous, as well as subversive. It was an ongoing struggle to contain their fringe activities and maintain order. It was an unending battle to keep aura in the hands of the Empire, where it belonged. Cain had solutions for this problem, and, like all the Ordinals, the most singular beings in the Emperor's service, he had laid these out to Jarvan. Jarvan had recoiled. Cain's proposals were ruthless and pragmatic. Hardline suppression, heavier penalties, military annexation of resistant worlds. Cain knew that an empire organized under his philosophies would be much more aggressive and unforgiving than the society Jarvan supported. Still, it was his duty to suggest these things, his duty to offer the Emperor alternatives. He was an Ordinal, Cain reminded him. That was, that was what ordinals did. He was not surprised when the Emperor backpedaled and almost chided Cain for his brutal proposal. That's why Jarvan was Emperor and Cain an ordinal. Cain was the attack dog that Jarvan kept on a leash. He only let him hunt when there were no other alternatives. And Jarvan liked to keep testing his attack dog to measure his loyalty and aggression. Ionan, Edgeworld. Cain wondered just what it was his old comrade Nakuri had found there. So... Here we get a bunch of world building for the universe. However, it serves a purpose for the themes and the action of the story. Like, again, like I talked about, if you're gonna do a bunch of world building, especially when you have otherwise started in Medias Res, then it needs to be for some kind of purpose, read the story that you're telling right now. And all of this has a purpose. Now, I think it's a little bit long-winded. Like, I would probably have cut some of it down. I would probably have simplified a lot of it. I might have cut out some stuff about, you know, um, biohacking purposes and you know, yada, yada, yada. And just kind of cut it down a little bit more. But the point that the, all of this is put to is to ex to show us, to explain to us that Kane is someone who cares about the Empire. He cares about yeah, keeping the Empire together, keeping it strong. He cares about making peace in the Empire, and he cares about his duty to the Emperor. He cares about his duty to his friend. These are things that matter to him, that are important to him, and for which he's willing to make sacrifices. Like, 
he makes these brutal proposals for how to you uh, how to reorganize their society in order to be more efficient and he knows that the emperor will reject them but he understands that it's his duty to present alternatives it's his duty to present ideas and he doesn't mind that he gets chided for it. He doesn't mind that he doesn't get rewarded for proposing ridiculous ideas that will not be carried out in reality because he considers it his job. This is very much the opposite of the typical trope, which is there is some someone in the Empire who is like highly militaristic and then the Emperor rejects their militaristic suggestion and they're all insulted and they're furious and they're, oh, I'm so mad at the Emperor. The Emperor is weak. I'm going to kill the Emperor and become the Emperor myself. Like, that's the usual setup for a guy for like a story where the advisor betrays his master as... Kane is eventually going to do is to have that like that clash of ideals be the source of the conflict. This is not so in this story, and that's kind of important. It's an interesting little subversion of that particular trope. He felt a tremor run through the deck. Their warship, the mighty fractal shear, had altered course. Captain Vasur would have ordered would have ordered its sling space engines to reshape the singularity sphere surrounding it so that they could turn out to Ionan. The streaks of light pa flashing past the window porch changed hue. Aura powered the ship's sling engines, creating the sphere that warped space-time around the hull, allowing it to skate through the upper layers of subspace at transluminal velocities, like a stone skipping across a lake. Uncumbered by current or surface tension, the portal and display told him that there was a six-hour journey time. So here we get an explanation-ish of how Aura allows... Like, like I said, when you set it up, you have to pay it off at some point. Now we have a techno babble understanding of how sling space work. So now this, all of this has absolutely no relationship to real physics. I'm not a phys uh, physicist, but I can tell you that right away. Like, Aura powered the ship's sling engines, creating the sphere that warped space-time around the hull, allowing it to skate through the upper layers of subspace at transluminal velocities. That doesn't mean anything. And it also doesn't have to. This is, like, the, the, um... Odyssey, the Odyssey skin universe, is a sci-fi fantasy. It's a sci-fi space opera universe. It's not a high, hard sci-fi universe. The science doesn't have to make sense. All we need to know as readers is, okay, there is an explanation for it. Like, there, there is a way in which this stuff works, and the metaphor that we're given for understanding how it works is a stone skipping across a lake, unencumbered by current or surface tension. TLDR, we can travel at light speed with this stuff. And by the way, that's one of the things that um, the original Star Wars movies understood really well, is that, like, there's a point in the story where there's tr trouble with the hyperdrive, and it can't do the coordinates and stuff, and that, that's a problem. Whereas, like, we get some techno babble about hyperspace and stuff like that, but they never go through, like, the physics of it. They never try to come up with some rational explanation of how the hell um, faster than light travel works. That's something that the expanded universe is happy to do, but the movies themselves shy away from it because, again... Who cares? Like, it's not relevant to the action of the Star Wars films. Kane heard a laugh behind him, a low chuckle. He looked around, half expecting to see Kilo bearing down on him. But there was no shout of, surprise! There was no one there at all. What armaments do you require? asked Kilo. He had returned to find his master standing at the open arsenal suite. Kane shrugged. He trained with every one of the weapons a hundred times. They bored him. Only a few felt right in his hands, and even they had their limits. That's set up, by the way. That's set up that's going to be paid off later when he finds the weapon that feels right in his hand. Discretion, he replied. What? Commander Nakuri recommended discretion, said Kane. Is that why we have coasted out a sling speed short of the target world? Yes, I'll go down alone. Tell the captain to prep my ship and hold station. But the deployment squad has been assembled, said Kilo. Fifty seasoned sling troopers, and I have cleaned my favorite axe. I'm going alone, said Kane. I'll call you if I need you. He selected a chrome photan pistol. <laughs> and a sleekly decorated fighting lance, two weapons he knew well. Then he paused and looked back to Kilo. Did you say something? Me? The fight mech replied. No. I thought I heard you laughing earlier, too. No, not me. More setup. So, photon pistol. <laughs> just say photon pistol? Photon, okay. Again, techno babble that doesn't get explained. I just, I just think that's a really funny name for a space laser pistol. With a brief flare of truster light, Kane's craft left the carrier bay on the upper hull of the fractal shear. His craft was a D-Max 3 superiority, a small interceptor used for interdiction fight flights and border work. An ordinal was supposed to use a more regal fleet transport, something that would impress the locals, something with ceremonial heft and a payload, of sp and a payload space that could carry trooper squads and combat vehicles. But Kane liked the speed and firepower of the little D-Max 3. He had liked them since his rookie tours as a subcommander in the Edge Squadrons. 
He weared off from the stationary base ship with an unnecessary burst of acceleration. The arrowhead craft rotated its angel nacelles. Pretty sure that's an actual word, but I don't actually know what it means off the top of my head. Tight rolled through a threaded veil of asteroids and pla planed down through a void of pink fog. Distant stars shone like lamps and scattered fireflies. Tracking showed Iona ahead. So, here again, we get some universe detail that... On my first reading, I was kind of annoyed by his oh, D-Max 3 superiority, small blah blah. All of that seemed unnecessary to me. But again, there's a point to it. It's about showing something about who Kane is as a person at this point. Where his choice of a small, single pilot, you know, nimble little fighter craft tells us, oh, he doesn't really care about all the ceremonial pomp and circumstance of being an ordinal. He doesn't really care about the whole, ugh. I have to represent the Empire, yada yada. He he likes to go outside of those um sort of those traditions, those expected behaviors. He likes to be a little bit subversive with the way he acts. He likes to make his own judgment and follow his own you know, he follow his own intuition about the best way to do things. And that's like that's again is a little bit of, of characterization of who he is as a character. Which then later on we'll see exactly how that works out for him. Kane rejected Autohelm and took her down on manual, skimming the cold, thin vapor of the atmospheric edge as he followed Nakura's beacon. The beacon signal, along with all flight data, was channeled directly through his interface, a steady stream of information playing against his retina. Nakura's ship was the gentle reminder, a suppression cruiser half the size of the fractal shear. It held a high orbit on the far side of the edge world, like a ghost on Kane's range detector. I like that, like a ghost on Kane's range detector. I, something I really like in sci-fi stories particular is when you mix poetry into the language. For example, the arrowhead craft notated in the needle cells, yada yada, tight rolled through a threaded veil of asteroids and planed down through a void of pink fog. This is poetic language. So the, the writer is using poetic language to describe the state of the planet. The temptation with sci-fi sometimes is to use sci-fi language, that is to use technobabble, to use technical descriptions for things. I like sci-fi a lot more when it tries to be poetic about it, when it tries to describe landscapes and aesthetic things in po in poetic terms, in, in terms of like emotionality, in terms of, um, of how it feels to go through it. Like he flies through a void of pink fog, right? A void of pink fog. That's a very different thing than saying, and he planed through a, a pink fog bank. Right, a void of pink fog that has a very specific feeling to it, and I really like that in sci-fi, um, in in in, in sci-fi fiction, is when you don't just talk like a sci-fi writer all the time. Which not, that's not fair to say. A lot of sci-fi writers do use a lot of poetry in their descriptions, which is what I think makes their prose great. Down through the cloud level, he tore across the open flats of ochre deserts and salt plains that reflected the daylight with blinding radiance. He gunned so low his craft kicked up a powder wake, sending small malformed dust devils dancing haphazardly across the dry terrain. Ahead, mountains, a long low range, pink and russet rock wind carved into sharp crags and angular shapes, like a coral reef raised from the water. Again, none of this is necessar necessary. You don't need to have all these um, descriptions of the beautiful landscape of all the of, the of the gorgeous world that we're living in. This is not necessary for the plot or the story, it doesn't really do much. But it gives us, it tells us something about what it feels like to be part of that universe. And that, your mileage may vary, but I think it's worth it to take a little bit of time, just every once in a while to take a little bit of time to describe the feeling of being in a particular environment. The beacon signal was pinging wildly, and I would say you could maybe cut some of it out. You could probably shorten it down a little bit just for brevity to avoid boring the audience, but I like it in general. The beacon signal was pinging wildly. He eased the nacelles around to breaking attitude. Breaking altitude? Attitude? Attitude, probably. Brought the nose up and swung in for landing. Below him lay a high plateau beneath a block of pink cliff. An encampment. Two Imperial transport shuttles parked and anchored. He extended the landing gear and descended vertically. Welcome to the butt crack of nowhere, said Nakuri. Kane jumped down from his open, co open cockpit into the hard glare of the sun. He smiled. To Nakuri, the old dog, everywhere was the butt crack of nowhere. They'd served together on many worlds, many tours, and that had been Nakuri's estimation of every single outer planet in Edgeworld. I don't think that's the proper form of address, Commander, Kane growled. Nakuri hesitated, his smile dropping. He hadn't seen Kane in a long time, and Kane was now a high and mighty ordinal. I'm sorry, he began. It's welcome to the butt crack of nowhere, sir. 
They grinned and embraced. By the way, this scene, this is lifted wholesale from episode one of Game of Thrones. I'm just saying, like, that's exactly how Stark greets the king. It, it's directly lifted from there. Honestly. And it's and it's a trope. Like, it, it's a trope of the thing of, oh, the, the, the guy who's still a, you know, rank-and-file commander, soldier dude in... in, in the military and the guy who made good in the leader hierarchy who became like a high and mighty or something, something but they have a friendship they have a dynamic together isn't it cool to see the high and mighty ordinal have a friendly relationship with one of the lower soldiers and again the point here is to tell us something about kane that he is someone who despite being in the upper echelons of imperial society would maintain a friendship with someone who's much much lower down on the rung than he is again it's something about telling us who Kane is as a person, what he cares about, what's interesting to him, the kinds of people he likes to associate with. Is it strictly necessary in this story? Yeah, I'm a little mixed on it, but it works. It's been too long, said Kane. Not long enough, she, Nakuri laughed. The circular silver interface over his right eye caught the sun like a wink. Silver interface, where Kane has a gold one, so establishing rank through visuals, that's quite clever. So what sort of clagging mess have you gotten into this time, Kane asked him. Clagging. We can infer that it means fucking, but since we can't use fucking in a League of Legends story that has to be appropriate for all audiences, we invent a word inside the fantasy universe that means fucking, but which isn't spelled fucking and therefore it's okay. That's a common thing to do, lots of fantasy and sci-fi writers do it. It always just kind of makes me laugh when I see it because it's always like, just say fucking, come on, just, just say fucking. Like, why wouldn't they have the word fuck? They speak English, they have the word fucking, surely. But it's, it's, a, it's a simple and effective way to get around it. Nakuri turned. His squad, ten sling troopers who, like him, were wearing full fight kit, kit and weapon rigs, were standing rigidly to attention. Each one of them towered over Kane in his simple black form-fitting suit. They were hardy veterans, all, and he knew most of them. Korla, Speaks, Rigo, the squad leader Rashid. He interfaced the names of the others quickly from the bio tags on their breastplates. So here, I think... Like fight kit, weapon rigs, sling troopers, and biotax. That's a lot of sci-fi jargon terminology to throw at us at once. And for me, this it got a little bit annoying for me reading through this. This part is like, oh my god, just say name tag instead of biotag. Just say they were wearing full kit. Just say they had like the fully armed with weapons or something like that. Do we need to know that there is a thing called a fight kit and that these soldiers have it? Do we need to know that there's such a thing as a weapon rig and these soldiers have it? Does it come up again later in the story? No. Is it really necessary to put it in here? No. Anyway, it paid to know names. Soldiers responded better to ordinals who treated them as equals. Again, a little bit of insight into Kane. He maintains friendly relationship with his subordinates because that's the kind of person he is, but also because it's part of his job. It helps him be more efficient at his work. Let's show him, people, said Nakuri. He brought Kane up to speed as they crunched over the plateau. It was Templars who had brought us here. Two of them, and a whole pack of their believers. Chased them out of Kaibal and they fled here. We thought they might be looking for a get-out, but this is clearly where they wanted to be. Why? asked Kane. Not clear. We, so we got down here and rounded them all up. Well, most of them. A few wouldn't go without a fight, so, you know, shots fired and all that. How many? Ten dead, all theirs, both Templars included. It was quite a fight. And how many of their followers were taken? Sixteen. Clack sack hippie subversives. We got them penned in the caves up ahead. Interrogations in progress. Kane raised an eyebrow. To find out? Anything. Templar strongholds, aura dumps, contacts, and of course, why they came here. Hell for leather. We know why, said a voice behind them. Kane and Nakuri stopped and turned. The sling troopers came to a halt. Something to say, Rashid? asked Nakuri. No, Commander, replied the squad leader. Not so fast, said Kane. I want to hear what Vichid has on her mind. The woman shrugged uncomfortably. Sorry, sir. I mean, sorry, Ordinal. I just spoke out of turn. Just this heat. You're in cooled fight gear, Rashid, replied Kane. Speak up. Well, the thing we found, that's what brought him. That's what they were after. Lovely little detail here that one of the soldiers is a woman. Again, from a world-building perspective, this tells us, okay, so ladies are in the military, which tells us something about the social structure is that it doesn't necessarily replicate the kind of... um the conservative soldiers, social structures we have on Earth, where it's like, oh, women shouldn't serve in the military. That doesn't seem to be a question in this universe. Like, men and women both in the military, who cares? And like, and, and again, if it had been the other way around, that there had been some note that all of them, of course, were men, then we would get some information about, okay, so how, what's the gender roles like in this universe? 
I think it's a nice way to do that world building without being intrusive, like without derailing the story in order to talk about the history of women in the military and, and stuff like that. You can kind of imply, okay, yep, that's a thing that happens here. And women are treated equally in the military as everybody else. That's an interesting little thing to put in there. They ascended the greatest slope towards the caves that honeycombed the lower section of the cliffs. The glare of the sunlight was hard and intense, so it was more than a relief to step into the maw of shadows at the base of the cliff. It felt like stepping into a refrigerated cellar. Akuri's interface beeped with an incoming message, and he excused himself by stepping aside. Kane and the sling troopers waited in the shade. The ordinal looked up the mouths of the caves, eroded out by millions of years of desert wind. And again, he heard something. A voice, not words, just a murmur. He etched away from the waiting troopers towards the cave. Their darknesses yawned at him, silent. Nothing. Then he heard the murmur again. Half murmur, half chuckle. Something just inside the nearest opening, perhaps? Something watching him, amused, snickering in the dark. He frowned and took another step. His own interface sounded. He opened the link. This is Kane, he murmured. A fuzzy image of Captain Vasura on the bridge of the fractal shear projected into his left eye. Ordinal, just an advisory. We detected a soft return moving into Ionan subspace that subsling. Soft return, Captain? No solid data, and we can't fix it. A ghost. Show me. Asura obliged. The retinal image switched to a live feed from the ship's main detection systems. Just a phantom track, no defined mass or density. In fact, the sort of data aberration that detection officers would usually dismiss as background distortion. But of course, Asura was being very careful with an ordinal on the ground. Various rogue agents use masking fields, Kane commented. My thoughts exactly, said Wasur. The Syndicate especially. We've seen a lot, of anti lot during anti-trafficking campaigns. If this is a masking field, it's a good one. Agreed. Very good. You want me to intercept Ordinal? Negative. Then should I bring us in closer? Get Ion in battery and range. Get Ion in battery range in case. Negative, Captain. We appear to have a situation down here. Subversive elements who might have come to retrieve something, maybe prior to an exchange. If this is the receiver come to collect, let's not scare them off. Let's have them unmask. And now I need water. I like doing these long videos, but good lord, they're hard on the system. If you're sure, Ordinal, I am captain. Let's see who we meet. This could open deep veins of information. Kane disengaged the link and turned to see Nakuri walking over. Let me guess, Kane said. A soft return? Nakuri nodded. The Shear has it too, he asked. Between your ship and mine, we've got most of the inner system covered, and it's probably nothing. I trust you told the gentle reminder to hold position. I take no action, Nakuri replied with a laugh. I remember the way you work, old friend. Bring the scoundrels in. You like to see their clagging faces. Nakuri turned and led him up the last stretch of slope to the largest cave mouth. The troopers followed them. Kane felt relaxed and content. It felt good to be operating alongside someone as trustworthy and smart as Nakuri. They made a good team, and they always had. This is set up, by the way. This is all set up for what's about to happen. <laughs> He paid no attention to the odd sense of unease lurking at the back of his mind. That was simple, healthy trepidation, the tension of handling a potential, a potentially, potentially volatile situation. He had no time for an encumbrance like that. They were penned in the outer caves of the cliff system. Nakuri's troopers had clapped the prisoners in force shackles while a second squad under the command of an officer called Solopass was guarding them. The prisoners were a maverick lot, with creatures of different species, their garments dirty and worn. Some had already been beaten in the hope of extracting answers, and Kane could see that they had all been stripped of aura-derived bio-enhancements, a process that had left some ugly wounds. As far as he was concerned, the Templars were a sect and nothing more. A quasi-mystical affiliation of subversives who believed they were the true guardians of aura, that they understood the material better than anyone else and were protecting it from the abuse of other parties. Kane had interrogated many Templars in his long career. He found them generally ridiculous. Their manner was obnoxious and condescending, exhibiting the sort of tolerant sympathy one got from any religious order. They believed they were privy to some great existential truth locked within the aura, something too good and refined for the likes of Demoxians, who actually got on with the business of keeping society running. They had naively mistaken a singular and natural resource of undoubted value for something more spiritual, as if aura was somehow a manifestation of the gods, or of, of creation, or a universal soul. Cain had seen that kind of lunacy before. Primitives on edge worlds worshipping trees or nature or ecosystems, or a cargo cult so astounded by a standard fight mech that they hailed it as a god. It was childish and ill-informed. This, all of this, is set up. Oh, this whole, again... 
this is a lot of world building, right? This is a lot of talking about who are the Templars, how do they fit into the universe. All of that would be rather unnecessary and annoying if it wasn't trying to make a point about Cain, which it is. It's telling us that he is... I mean, I guess as close as you get to an atheist in this universe, um, he, he does not believe in spiritual stuff. He does not believe in spirituality. He believes the aura has no internal soul. There's nothing mystical about it. It's just it's just a resource. It has a scientific truth. You don't need to worry about it beyond that. Which is setting up the irony that happens when he is possessed, where he becomes obsessed with aura and believes that... Like, I guess I can spoil this. Rast tells Cain that he is the voice of Aura, that he's the voice of this mineral, that he is, you know, a, a supernatural manifestation of the Aura itself, and Cain doesn't necessarily believe him at first, but after a good long while being exposed to Rost, being exposed to the madness that is contained within that scythe, as we can see, um, if we listen to his voice clips, he does begin to believe this stuff, he does be begin to believe that he's chosen, that he's special, that he has a great existential truth locked within the aura that he knows, but which is too good and refined for the likes of anybody else who might want to use it. He begins to get these delusions of grandeur that he is so dismissive of right here. And again, the point of this is to show the transformation that Cain undergoes, the person that is lost when he becomes corrupted by Rast. The Templars, however, were unusual in that they were well-organized, often militant, and had somehow established a network of support across the galaxy. Their beliefs were deranged and laughable, yet their lowly followers pursued them with vigor, depriving the Empire of valuable aura supplies or actually striking at commercial holdings. They were subversives of the worst kind. Cain walked into the caves where they were being held and saw the same old, fierce, devoted, determined, devoted faces. People who had faith in what they fought for. He also noticed, with some satisfaction, how the wretched prisoners looked aghast at the sight of an ordinal. They knew that this was the end of the line, and that their pathetic beliefs could no longer protect them. I am Ordinal Sheeta Cain, he told them. You understand the authority I represent. I understand you have refused to answer the questions set to you. They cowered. He noted at least six alien species represented in their numbers. Who to pick? The Skulldoid, perhaps? They were fragile creatures. You seem to have no fear of sling troopers, who nevertheless outgun you, round you up, and put you in chains, he continued. I think that's sad, because the experience should have demonstrated to you that you have no option but to comply. You will answer my questions. We will tell you nothing, snarled a large Korobak. No, said King, and why is that? Because what we know is not fit for the likes of you. Several others murmured in agreement. The Korobak, then, perhaps, Kane mused. He was the biggest, the ringleader. Making a sam make an example of him, and the rest would fall into line. No, too easy. Kane smiled. You just answered a question, Korvac. I, I asked a question, and you answered it, Kane went on. It wasn't too difficult, was it? So it's not questions generally you have an issue with, just specific ones. I won't play your games, you clag, snapped the Korvac. This is a little bit too precious. Like, Kane is trying to get a one over, uh, like get, getting a gotcha on him by saying, Ah, but technically you actually answered one of my questions, so, like, you're, you've, you've just committed a sin against your stated moral principle. <laughs> That's... It doesn't really work because it's the kind of really low-hanging fruit that extremely shitty people go for in conversations. It doesn't really make him come across as affable or charming or fun or intelligent. It just makes him come across as kind of a garden-variety dick. So I would have really cut that interaction up from, from the story, because like from, from my perspective, it just makes him seem like a, a lowbrow asshole. I won't play your games, you clag, snapped the quarterback. Yet you expect me to play yours. I think something has to give here, sir, and I believe you're in no position to dictate terms. So let's begin. I want names, a list of your contacts and associates in the Edge Worlds, the two Templars who led you here, the people they had dealings with before you all came to Ionan. The prisoner looked away. Let's start with the first name, Cain said. We were not led here, the quarterback muttered. I'll give you nothing. The first name, please. The creature would only glare at the cave floor. Cain unclasped his holster and drew his photan pistol. His long chrome form glinted in the ruddy twilight gloom. He thumbed the activator, and there was a whine as the cell rose to a discharge level. The first name, Cain said more forcefully. The prisoner shook his head. Kane slowly raised the pistol and aimed it at the kneeling Korobak's forehead. Several of the others murmured in fear. The first name, he repeated. Shoot me if you want, said the Korobak, still glaring at the floor. That's the imperialist mentality. Threaten us, brutalize us. So shoot me. Then you'll definitely get nothing. 
I will pass through the Aura Gate with the blessing of all Templars and the satisfaction of knowing you have been defied. Yes, said Kane. I'm sure you would. But that's not exactly how the game works. He switched aim. Now the Fotan gun was pointing at the girl beside the Korobak. She was an odd one, wide-eyed and solemn. Unlike the others, she chose to look directly at Kane and his gun. Give me the first name, Korobak, or it won't be you passing through the gate to the hereafter. You'll still be here, very alive, not blessed or satisfied at all, with her brains on your clothes. The Korobak looked sharply at the girl, his eyes bulging in concern. He hissed. Oh, I would, said Kane. I will. One by one, as many of you as it takes until I have my list of names and answers to all the other questions I have. It's a very simple game. It really depends on how many dead bodies it takes for you to understand that answers are less important than lives. One, three, fifteen, a hundred? How could you be so cruel to- This is my job. I don't like it. I think I enjoy killing people over something as simple as a question. You and you alone are making this necessary. You're leaving me no choice. In fact, I don't know how you could be that cruel. This poor girl doesn't deserve to get her head vaporized just because you're slow to answer. The Korobak swallowed hard. I, I will not betray. Again, the point here is to characterize Kane, who he is, how he thinks, how he behaves. And what we get here is that he's capable of profound cruelty and brutality in the name of his job. And I don't buy this. I don't completely buy this. I don't buy that he's not enjoying it. And the reason I don't buy it is because he's the one saying it. And there's a big difference between Cain saying out loud to another person, I don't like it, I don't enjoy killing people over something as simple as a question. And that being said in the narrator voice, like the narrator voice, which is the one that describes the action, if it had been, how could you be so cruel to, and then Cain felt no pleasure in doing, like if it had been the authoritative third-person narrator voice telling us in no uncertain terms how Kane is feeling right now, I would believe it. But I think the author does something interesting by making a Kane protests that he doesn't enjoy killing, but he's the one doing it out loud to another character to whom he has no, you know, incentive to be honest. And I think, at least I read it as a little bit more foreshadowing for why Cain maybe finds it a little bit easier to be corrupted by the scythe than he would like to think. Well, I suppose I admire a person with principles, Cain sighed. Principles are magnificent, especially when you're not the one dying for them. He looked at the girl. Her eyes were so huge, but there was oddly no fear in them. He'd never seen anyone quite so calm. It was unnerving. He felt he wanted to question her, her in particular, and learn all she knew. But his intent was set now. He'd chosen her as the example. Backing down would be weakness, and that would simply bolster the resolve of the rest. Still. You know, you can make up for your friend's lack of cooperation, he said directly to the girl. I'll give you that much. You speak, the first name, show this fool how bloodshed can be avoided, and I'll be lenient. She stared back at him silently. Quickly, Kane said. The first name, I don't give such chances very often. Sona can tell you nothing, the Korobak snapped, almost sobbing. Oh, I'm sure she can replied Kane, staring into the girl's eyes. I'm sure she's dying to. Sona, that's your name. Sona. It's very easy. One ver word, one name. That's where we start. The first name. The girl made no response. Kane felt his annoyance growing into outright anger, but he didn't let it show. He'd been restrained and given her a chance, and now she was making him look like an idiot. No one did that. Sona, you disappoint me, Kane said, and pulled the trigger. See, this is why... I don't quite buy that Kane doesn't enjoy the killing. Because this girl has made him look like an idiot by doing nothing. She, Sona hasn't challenged him or done anything, she just hasn't responded to him. And he gets annoyed enough by that to get angry and be resentful. So there's a lot of pride there, right? Pride goes before the fall and all that. And that's, again, this is a clever way to explain that. It's a clever way to show that Cain has that little spark, that little spark of pride, of anger, that perhaps he enjoys his job just a little bit more than he'd like to admit, which is the thing, of course, that Rost will take terrible advantage of. The blast wave tore through the cave. It took Cain a moment to clamber back to his feet. Dust was fuming down the tunnel from outside, debris, debris scattering from the ceiling. 
The concussion had lifted him off his feet and his shot had gone wide, missing the girl's head. Two more loud blasts echoed from outside. Move at move! Nakura yelled. The sling troopers, some of whom had been thrown aside too, scrambled toward the exit. The prisoners cowered in terror, all except the girl. Keep watch on them! Kayon yelled to Salapas. He ran for the exit, reaching the light in time to see the small fight ship making its third pass. One of Akuri's carrier transports was already a burning mass of buckled metal. The fight ship, a matte green dart, blinked in low over the plateau and discharged its heavy cannons. Blades of light slashed down from the photon annihilator pot. Good lord. Still photon. It still cracks me up a little bit. And the second carrier blew up, its bulk lifting on a column of fire that shredded it, flipped it, and brought it down hard, crushing Kane's little D-Max 3. Nakuri was shouting commands and his sling troopers were forming a line around the cave mouth, weapon rigs engaged to fill the sky with a hail of fire. Wait! Kane shouted. What? asked Nakuri. Hold fire! If they wanted us dead, they would have leveled the mountain. They want our attention. Hold fire! Nakuri ordered. Contact our ships, Kane told him. Tell them to remain in standoff. No stupid attempts at rescue or relief. You're playing with fire, old friend. Always. Now do it! Kane heard Nakuri activate his interface. He walked forward. Black smoke was blowing horizontally off the mass of burning ship wreckage. Heat haze at ground level made the smoke ripple and twist. He could feel the warmth on his face. Come on, he murmured. Get on with it. Come on. The green fight ship reappeared. It came up over the edge of the plateau at a stall speed hover. Stall speed. <laughs> its nacelles downblasting to give it lift. Sunlight flashed off the tinted canopy. It edged through the churning smoke towards them. A second one appeared, gray, coming in from the left. Then a third. This one was red, and came into view moving down the plateau centerline directly towards them. The three ships stopped to hub at a hover, low hover 20 meters away. Ah, clag, said Nakuri. Syndicate. Yes, replied Kane. He had recognized at once the hybrid, custom-fitted style of the aggressor craft. Black market weapon system. Some illegal, some alien, disproportionately large compared to the small hulls they had been grafted to. The ships themselves were ex-imperial tech, old models undoubtedly salvaged from junk worlds, retrofitted by the Syndicate's ingen ingenious weaponeers. This is a little bit too much world building. It doesn't really do anything for the story particularly. It's not terrible, but it's just kind of doesn't do much for the story. I would have removed it, but that's just me. The red ship, the largest, carried a pod on its belly, a masking field generator, more contraband. The soft return hadn't been from one ship, it had been a vague sensor goat generated by these three, moving in tight formation inside the mask field. No wonder there had been no hard data on mass or density, they'd made themselves fluid, probably in a tumble trajectory, and had no doubt, doubt split and separated just as soon as they hit the atmosphere. Again. A lot of technobabble explanation that I feel like is perhaps a little bit too much. Like, we don't really need to know how they cheated their way past the sensors. We just need to know that they did. Clever, Kane thought. Typical criminal activity. The kind that regularly got past smuggling blockades and interdiction fleets. The red ship moved forward a little. Its tinted canopy popped and opened. I can take this clagger's head off, advised Nakuri. Let me talk, Kane replied. But get all your troopers to lock now. When we take them down, it's got to be instant or they'll cremate this whole area. Nakuri nodded. King left the shadows, slithered down to the, sl the slope and walked into the hard sunlight of the plateau top. Head high, he strode across the dust toward the lead machine. Your business here, he called out. The red fight ship's cockpit was a two-seat. A visored pilot occupied the front, staring down at Kane through the gun sights. A figure stood up in the back seat and took off his respirator mask. I do, he said. Didn't think I'd be doing it with an ordinal, but every day is new and exciting, right? It was Sago. Corin Sago, one of the chief players in syndicate activities on the Galactic Edge. Kane's interface identified him instantly by face and voice recognition, but Kane knew him anyway. All Demaxian officers knew Sago's face from a hundred thousand bounty postings. He'd remained alive and at liberty for a long time, because he so seldomly showed up in person. So what was so important about today? I'm honored, Sago, said Kane, seeing you face to face. Sago grinned, oh, the honor is mine, Sheeta Kane. Heard so much about you. A lot of damage to Imperial equipment there, said Kane, gesturing to the burning wrecks. Just wanted to be empathetic. Emphatic, rather. <laughs> you were successful. What's the business here? I take it you wanted the Templars and their followers? Some prearranged deal? Sago looked generally, genuinely surprised. Templars? What the clack do I want with Templars? I don't know what the hell the voices I'm doing for him. <laughs> you hadn't agreed to meet them here. No, sir. Nothing to do with me. What, then? Same reason as you, I guess said Sago. I mean, it's not every day an ordinal slings out to an edge world either. I take it it's here. It is, said Kane, calmly lying to cover his lack of knowledge. How did you hear about it? Sago looked thoughtful. Same way you did, I guess. 
Kane was getting an odd read from the man. Corrin Zago was infamously confident and full of swagger, but he seemed troubled, uneasy. Well, I just... Kane shrugged, mirroring the man's awkwardness. You know, I do. Sago nodded, earnest. Strangest thing, eh? It calling out like that, like a voice in the stars. I, I just knew. I knew I had to come and get it. Knew it had to be mine. With respect, ordinarily, you won't stop me having it. Hand it over or stand aside. Whatever. I'm taking it. Resistant. Well, we'll cook the lot of you, snatch it, and be massed and gone before your capital ships can get within sniffing distance. I have no doubt. This didn't make any sense. Zago was dangerous, but not insane. His three fight ships had Kane's small ground forces outclassed, but the gentle reminder and the fractal shear were the sort of locus amarta vessels that syndicate forces would go out of their way to avoid. And Corin Zago had come in person. This wasn't the typical bravura Kane had read about. This was something else. Compulsion. Obsessive. That made him vulnerable. Kane took a long, slow breath. Time to clear his mind. Time to do the sort of work that had made him an ordinal. Well, you've got us tight, my good man, he said, opening his arms in an elegant core world flourish, a ritual gesture that anyone would recognize as a formal submission. Then he turned that into the full bow of surrender, dropping to one knee, shoulders forward, his arms by his sides. His right hand braced the ornate lance at his, at his side at a 45 degree angle, base in the dirt, blade upwards, the angle of military honor. We must give way to you in these circumstances. Kane could feel the prickle of the heat, smell the billowing smoke. He could feel Corin Zago's gaze on him, perhaps surprised at the ease of his triumph. Kane was a strong man. His basic biology had been finessed by acute training disciplines and further enhanced by science. Like all ordinals, he was a significantly amplified being. He waited until Zago began to speak, just the first syllable of the reply. You. Still kneeling, K Kane cast the lance, an underarm throw with his right arm. No wind-up, just a straight pitch, hurling the lance across the angle it was already pointing in. He didn't even look up. He was still kneeling and bowing. Propelled by the strength of his arm, the lance struck the underside of the hovering red fight ship just in front of the masquerade pod. Okay. The broad blade had punctured the ship's skin and the lance kept going through the condensers and the attitude management systems contained in the belly. Through them, through the floor of the cockpit, through the base of the pilot's fight, flight seat, and on through Corin Zago. When it came to rest, it was impaling the hovering ship like a meat skewer, the end of the haft poking out from the underside, the head transfixing Zago and emerging through his back. He was pinned upright against his high-backed seat. There was a look of surprise on his very dead face. Abruptly, everything was in motion. The red fight ship began to wallow violently, its internal systems ruptured and torn. Its engines howled with incorrect pressure, uncorrected pressure. The syndicate pilots took a moment to react, just a second while they processed what had happened. And then it was too late. Nakuri had been waiting. The instant he saw Kane hurl the lance, he had given the signal, his sling troopers opening fire in perfect unison. Gun ricks kicked off, screaming steams of photon, <laughs> photon fire at the grey and green fight ships. The first simply came apart where it was hovering, utterly disintegrated by the sustained heavy fusillade. Its drive core exploded, and the fireball threw fragments of pockmarked, distorted hull in all directions. Turning his kneeling crouch into an upward spring, Kane leapt. The wildly wallowing red ship has al had almost lurched low enough to clip his head off, and the le his leap cleared the starboard wing. The craft was almost spinning as the pilot fought to regain control. The port wingtip bounced off the ground and scattered a spray of pebbles. The hover thrust was kicking up dust like a desert storm. Kane landed on the hu lurching hull, clawed his way towards the open cockpit. Saga was still pinned in place, staring into the distance, each jolt of the ship shaking him against the flight seat. The pilot was too busy fighting with the controls to do anything else. Akuri's trooper was, was still hoping, hosing fire, but the green fight ship was proving harder to kill. It had some kind of custom shield that soaked up the photon energy. Flecks of light stippled off the greasy haze around its prow. It screamed forward, seeking retribution. Its weapon pods opened up, stitching detonations across the dust towards the sling trooper formation. Before Nakuri could order an immediate scatter, two of his men were incinerated where they stood. The ship leveled up and began to pick off the others as they fled. Ground fire, even from stalwart sling troopers, only worked against aircraft when the aircraft were unprepared. They had lost the advantage of surprise. Kane grabbed the fight ship's pilot with one hand and threw him from the cockpit. The man cried in surprise as he bounced off the dipping wing and plunged to the ground below. Gripping the canopy frame, Kane dropped into the pilot position. His interface told him the stabilizer controls were utterly ruined. The lance had sheared, speared the guts of several principal systems. He made lightning-fast adjustments, compensating for overthrust in one nacelle port that had flamed out altogether. He slammed the red ship around with the cockpit still open and limped it forward, accelerating at extremely low level, just kissing the ground. 
The green fight ship was strafing the slopes. Kane could see it extending its main weapon parts to level the whole mountainside. Hauling on the stick, he activated the red, sh red ship's fire control, armed the main battery and locked the green fight ship ahead of him. He opened up with the primary photon array. The force of the unleashed fire rocked the destabilized craft so hard it swung drunkenly out of true, and the last blaze of shots went wide, shaking off like Lumo tracers into the sky beyond the mountains. What the hell is Lumo tracers? Oh well. <laughs> but the first part of the barrage had been dead on. The green fight ship lost its rear end, and then one nacelle. Its pilot tried to steady it, but the whole thing was coming to pieces in the air, shredding from the tail forward. It began to lift, trailing a huge plume of fire and debris. Then, abruptly, as if the effort was too great, it plunged like a rock and impacted Noah's first. The detonation raced a shockwave across the sands, throwing out a large crater of heat-fused dirt. Kane struggled to keep his commandeered fight ship airborne. Multiple fail warnings screamed from the control board. He cut power incrementally, nursing it down. The red ship hit the dust, bounced, and then slid, digging in with one lolling wing. He killed all power. Grit was still pattering off the front screen and hull. He lifted himself out of the seat, took one last glance at the Sago's dismayed expression, and jumped back down on the ground. As he walked away, something caught inside the hull and fire began to flare out. By the time he reached Nakuri, the red fight ship had become a blazing funeral pyre for the man skewered in its heart. Nakuri was gathering his troops. He looked at Kane with a mix of shock and admiration. You're a crazy fool, he said flatly. I disagree, Kane replied, but I think it's long past time I saw what this whole mess was about. Oh, gotta need some more water after that one. So, all of this is pretty much just quite good cinematic writing. Like, there's a whole lot of... The, the writer is doing a lot of work to kind of set the scene for what is happening. Like, he talks about how... <clears throat> Um, how he's making lightning fast adjustments compensated for overthrust, slamming the red ship around with the cockpit still open, limping it forward, accelerating at extremely low speed, just kissing ground. This is a lot of cinematic language. It's meant to generate specific images in your head, create a kind of cinematic experience of what's going on. It's almost like kind of writing out a comic. Like if, if this was kind of the script for a comic book, then he's describing each panel of the comic as it happens. And in terms of, um, of writing action, I feel it's quite effective because, like, the whole scene could be could be written out essentially as Kane jumped into the to the red ship, corrected it, aimed its its uh, its batteries at the green fight ship, and fired, destroying it. You would have described exactly the same action with like a tenth of the words, but it wouldn't have been nearly as exciting. And this is kind of I feel like the story needed this. I feel like the story needed this. You know, this tense standoff. Where Kane is outmatched and outgunned um, by by three large by three uh, um, airships that are patently capable of destroying him and everybody who 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 is who is, he's alongside. So he has to use the element of surprise. He has to be resourceful. He has to fight like a sci-fi hero, like coming out by the skin of his teeth by thinking quickly and acting faster. And that I think is quite good. Like that works um, for me. By the way, just just a sec. I'm gonna have to readjust something. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, this, this is the danger of recording these things in one take, is that sometimes you really, really need to sit down and you have to lower your entire desk to make it happen. <sighs> Where were we? Right. Beyond the caves where the prisoners were being held, there was a hole in the world. It was a rough shaft, 30 meters across, which cut straight down for hundreds more. Kane stood at the lip and looked down. The rock had been cut by something excised on a huge scale even the main batteries of an armada slingship couldn't have removed a slice of planet so cleanly and just where was the removed mass had it been annihilated down there said nakuri kane had begun to clamber down anyway following the ragged contours of the shaft's inner wall up close it looked like heat had done this work the exposed rock was glossy pink and gleamed like polished gemstone but there was also a thick layer of dust on all the upper surfaces. This excision had been made a while ago, perhaps even thousands of years. Quite without warning, Kane had the sudden impression of a red-hot metal ingot being dropped onto a glacier, melting its way swiftly downward, leaving a borehole with gleaming walls of refrozen ice. But what could do that to rock? Set up, letting us know exactly the scale of the danger that Rast represents. 
He scanned for forensic traces via his interface as he made his descent. Coming down behind him, Nakuri clearly heard Gas Kane's gasp of surprise. I know, right? He said. These ratings correct, Kane murmured. They seem to be. This isn't here, said Kane, making his interface rework the scan. No, it's not. It's as if... There was no easy way for Kane to describe it. The quantum traces were bizarre. It was as though a piece of another reality, another spatial dimension altogether, had intersected briefly with this mountain on Ionan, negated it utterly, and left this void behind like an empty wound. A wound that crackled with a residue of the otherness that had made it. So again, here we're getting sort of the setup for what exactly are they going down here to find? And here, the story takes kind of an interesting twist, because up until this point, it had been essentially a Marvel movie, right? Like, it had been essentially sort of a sci-fi space action movie with a little bit of humor, a little bit of charm, a, a kind of a compelling anti-hero as the lead, and so on and so forth. But now, we're talking about intersections from different realities. We're, we're talking about the, the stuff that uh, is the usual preserve of cosmic horror. Like, there's something from another reality that has intersected with the world that has obliterated some otherness that has appeared. And so the tone of the story changes, as is appropriate, because it's about to veer into that direction a little bit. And that, again, is kind of a hard thing to manage, um, to, to merge those two styles without it feeling completely out of place. But I think the, the, the writer here makes it work. Kane didn't reply. He was speculating. Is this a result of an interspatial collision, some quantum anomaly, anomaly? Deliberate or accidental? Those phenomena were only theoretical, or the rare and catastrophic result of sling drive failures. This could be evidentiary proof of the multiversal proposition. Akuri had done the right thing. This was ordinal business, and Kane's already high standing would be boosted by it. A groundbreaking discovery. It would make him the most famous man in the Demoxian Empire. Indeed, it was the sort of thing that could propel a man to the very top. Kane paused. He was shocked that he was thinking this way. There was work to be done here, and Ordinal's a duty. Assess, analyze, reflect, gather up everything for the good of the Empire. Secure this discovery in the name of... A new thought entered his mind. A burning thought that also disturbed him. He knew he should be consulting with Nakuri, planning the process of investigation. But he didn't want to. He wanted to keep it for himself. He didn't want anyone in here. Not even Nakuri. No one else was worthy. Kane caught himself again. It was no wonder that the others had come here. The Syndicate, the Templars... This was an astonishing prize, except... How did they know? Kane asked. What? I came here because you called me. You came because you were chasing the Templars. What brought the Templars here? They heard about it too? Nakori ventured. From who? They deal in secrets, forbidden lore, all that nonsense. Maybe some legend or myth or... Ugh, I don't know, a treasure map? That rang false to Kane. If anyone, anyone, at any point in time had found this, they would have used it, used the data, the information it presented. It would have become a holy site, a shrine, or would have gathered a culture around it or made a man into an emperor, or been the cornerstone of a new empire altogether. No, no one knew about this. The Templars had come here instinctively. And the Syndicate? He asked Nakuri. What about them? Sago knew, Kane thought. That filthy opportunist hadn't even been aware of the Templars' presence. This was what he had come for, and he had come obsessively, risking everything, even a confrontation with superior Imperial forces. And he'd come because something had called him, called out to him across the gulf of space. Kane's skin felt clammy. He skidded down the last few meters, his unease growing. There was something at the bottom of the pit, something that looked as if it was fused into the bedrock. What the... We think that's what did it, said Nakuri. Like it fell here and made the hole, his voice trailed off. Have you touched it? Kane asked. No, sir. None of us. None of us dared. Kane crouched down. The object lay like a dark fossil embedded in the pale matrix of rock suspending it, like the bones of something impossibly ancient now exposed to the light. He could make out a long, beautifully fashioned handle, slightly curved. A huge blade head. Handle and blade were both forged from some dark material his interface couldn't identify, and apparently proportioned for humanoid hands. A scythe. A war weapon, a masterpiece that matched no cult known cultural template. Kane wondered how something could be so beautiful and yet so ugly at the same time. He heard a low chuckle. What? he asked, looking at Nakuri. I didn't say anything, Nakuri replied. Kane tried his interface, but the signal was dead. We're too deep, said Nakuri. Something down here is blocking communications. Go back up, said Kane. Signal the fractal shear. I want a science team assembled with full monitor instruments. Get them down here in two hours. We're going to take this place apart, piece by piece, and extract every last scrap of information. 
Akuri nodded, but didn't leave. I've changed, he said. What do you mean? Now you're an ordinal. The tone of your cane scoffed. I don't have time for this, he said. That grandstanding against the syndicate. What was that? I lost four men. Four men who didn't need to die just so you could show off. It was a delicate situation. We could have called in the main ships, just wiped them out, but you had to play your show-off games. Sir. We got the result I needed, said Kane. Four men dead. Commander, go and signal the ship. I will not ask you again. Akuri faltered. I brought you here... Gods, I brought you here because I knew this wasn't for me. Above my pay grade. I thought... I thought of you. I thought you'd know what to do. That you'd be worthy of it. Worthy of it? Of this prize, I mean. Who... I mean, who am I? I'm not... I'm not worthy of... He looked at Kane. But I thought you were. I thought I was doing my duty to the Empire and my friend, but I see you now, what you're like, what you've become. Kill him for that. Kane looked around. Someone had spoken. Are we alone? He whispered. What? Asked Nakuri, exasperated. Commander, did you post any guards down here? No. Then who just spoke? No one just spoke. What's wrong with you? I don't know who you are anymore. Go and signal the ship now. Then come back and tell me you've done it. Nakuri glared at him, then turned and clambered away. Kane remained crouched over the embedded weapon. It was you, wasn't it? He asked. You know it was. I call some here. I can't do the growly voice the whole time. It's impossible. Some come. I'm only interested in the worthy ones. People keep using that word. Who's worthy? And of what? Of me. I'll know who's worthy when they prove themselves. Maybe it's you. I don't know what you are. You don't have to. I just need to know that, know you. I'll keep calling until I found the one. Then I'll stop. Because I won't need to anymore. I'm an ordinal of I care little about what you are. What interests me is who you are. Your ambitions, your dreams, what you're capable of. How you think about the cosmos. How you think the cosmos should work told you I'm an ordinal because that's what matters, said Kane sharply. I have a job to do. A duty. A duty you resent. A duty you find increasingly frustrating. Following a man you think is growing weak. Pledging to a cause you think is overcautious. Frustrated. Day after day that no one shares your clarity of thought. That no one dares to act the way you want to act. That no one has the strength. My duty is to secure the site for the Democracian Empire. I don't believe I'm actually having a conversation with some antique weapon. I believe I'm being exposed to quantum variants. This is my mind, playing tricks. I'm a hallucination now, am I? This site is an anomaly of great scientific value. You are the principal artifact within it. I'm, I'm imagining voices because of the exotic trace energies of this location, and corey has been gone a long time, wouldn't you say? Kane rose. He checked his interface's chronometer. Nakuri had been gone for nearly an hour. An hour? How had so much time passed? Time is another illusion you can soon dispense with. If I'm worthy, Kane spat. He turned and began the climb back to the surface. He ignored the chuckle that came after him. Water time! Ah, oh, good lord. I need a better Rost voice. I can't do it right now. My throat is just too tired. <clears throat> There was no sign of anyone. Akuri? The communication link was empty. Something must have happened. More Syndicate, more of Sago's men. Surely Kane would have heard shooting. He drew his pistol and stalked forward. The prisoners were still in their cave, silent and terrified. They blinked at him as he entered. Where are your guards, he asked. No one answered. He crossed to the girl, Sona, and lifted her to her feet. I've seen what drew you here. I've seen it. Tell me about it. She didn't answer. Sona, he said. You need to speak now. She stared at him. He tightened his grip on the pistol. Don't waste her. She's far too valuable. Haven't you figured that out yet? You need her. Kane pushed the girl back down. He walked to the mouth of the cave. The sling trooper's blade nearly took his head off. Kane ducked and let the sword strike rock. Two shots from his pistol took the trooper down, his, tr his body sliding down the wall and onto the ground. Rigo, one of the Kuris, a good man. None of them are good enough, though. Are you... They came at him from all sides. Photan blasts lit the rocky hallway. He returned fire, dropped two more, then had to spin kick to drive off another. The trooper staggered away, clutching his splintered visor. Kane tore the glaive out of his hand, then cut him in half with it. 
He wheeled. An upstrike with the glaive's half knocked another trooper onto his back. Reverse. The butt end sticking into the belly of a man lunging from behind him. Spin. The blade slicing home. Someone shot at him. Photan shots. Block, block, block. The glaive was whirling in his hands. It's coated titanium, absorbing the power and deflecting the shots away. What the clag is this? He bellowed. You don't deserve it, a voice yelled back. It shouldn't be for you. It was Nakuri. Kane plunged forward. He kicked the legs out from under a charging sling trooper, then pinned him to the ground. A sheet slammed into them both from the side. The squad leader was all armored, bulk, and augmented strength. She swung a fist. Kane tried to block, but her charged gauntlet snapped the glaive's haft. Kane snarled, spun back to evade the next swing, then plunged the broken ends of the weapon into the Vashit's chest. Speaks came at him. Kane killed him with a back with a beak fist to the nasal bone. Beak fist, okay. Stand your men down, Nakuri, he yelled, moving towards the light of the tunnel mouth. This is lunacy! This is the test. Nakuri, we're being toyed with. This isn't you. Oh, but it is, a voice echoed back. This is the this is me, the real me, me for the first time. I see it all now, how it should be. Nakuri! Armored fists closed around his throat from behind, and Kane started to choke as they throttled him. Nakuri's right, he heard Solapass say. You're just some jumped-up fool, Kane. So pleased with your clagging self. It shouldn't belong to you. You don't deserve it. <clears throat> Kane flexed and threw Solapass right over him. The man landed hard. Who then, he asked. You? Obviously. Solapass was springing up, ripping out a blade. It's chosen me. It says I'm the one. I heard it say so. There was a photon flash, and Solipass's head was vaporized, his body crumpled. That's a lie, stammered Korla, edging forward. His eyes were wide. His pistol was still aimed at Solipass. Me! It called my name! We're all being played with, said Kane. Korla snapped around, aiming his gun at the ordinal. All of us, Korla! All of us! It's in our heads. It's making us do this. Maybe. But it doesn't lie, said Korla. Not to me! We don't know what it does. Put the gun down, Korla growled. I know what it does. It makes you what you should be. I see that. Clear as day. It claims you. It makes you perfect. It makes you see sense. It makes you know who you can trust. Who needs to live or die. That's not right, said Kane. It is. It told me. It told me I was the one. He fired, but Kane was already moving. The blast scorched his hip just as he came in under Corla's extended arm and broke it. Corla dropped to his knees, clutching his elbow. Kane snatched the pistol away. It told me, the trooper whimpered. Kane went to walk past him, but he grabbed at Kane's leg. Kane put him out of his misery with a single shot. Oi. He reached the cave mouth. Nakuri! Nakuri was waiting for him, lance in hand. I admit, the commander said, I made a terrible mistake. Calling you. You! That was an error. I just wasn't confident enough. I didn't think I could handle it. That, that I could do it. Do what? Be what it needed. But I can. I see that now. It doesn't need the likes of you. You won't do it justice, but a veteran like me, well, that's a different story. I'll be everything it ever wanted. Nakuri, said Kane, toss the lance, back off. You're out of your mind. It told me you'd say that. We're all being influenced by interspatial- No, no, we're not. This only started when you arrived. I've been here for days. That's because I'm the one it wants, said Kane. It was waiting for me. Now it's testing me. Testing you. To see if I'm ruthless enough for its needs, and you... Nakuri, you're my friend. It's using you. Toss the lance. We can secure this entire... No, it's testing me. You're not what it wants. You're nothing. We're not friends. God, you think we were ever friends. And you think you're the special one. The chosen one. The worthy one. It's just like you. So clucking arrogant. So full of your own importance. Nakuri took a step forward. Kane fired again and again. But the spinning staff spat the shots away, deflecting them into the cave walls. Two more steps and the whirling blade cleaved the barrel off the Photan pistol. Kane back flipped away. The blade crisped the ground where he had been standing. He threw himself into Nakuri, delivering a gut punch then a blow to the neck. Nakuri staggered backwards before Kane's spin kick broke his jaw and dropped him. Not me. Nakuri bubbled, broken. Not you either. Others are coming. Others? Just hold still. I need to get you to a medivac. Kill him. Shut up. Prove what you are. Kill him. Shut up. Kane walked clear of the cave and into the sunlight. You're running out of time. Make your choice. He could see the gentle reminder. Nakuri had called it in after all. It was on low approach from the west, six kilometers distance, filling the sky, skimming in the mountains. Immense. Gun ports opening for surface de decimation. A whole warship full of men and women, all of them answering the call. Men and women who thought they were worthy. Men and women who had each been told that by the same voice. Kane opened his communication link. Brackel Shear, give me Captain Vasur. Speaking, sir, we have a situation, Captain. Priority one, a mutiny. Lock the gentle reminder immediately. 
Sir, you hurt me. Lock and fire. Full battery. Sir, she's one of ours. Do as I tell you immediately. You'll be letting an ordinal die. Lock and fire. Priority one. Mutiny situation. Yes, sir. We're on, on approach. Engines engaged. We'll be in firing range in eight minutes. Who's slow? Nakuri's ship will obliterate you long before that. And you, Kane muttered. I'll survive. I'll wait. I'll call again and see who comes next time. Sure, worthy. Once you're claimed, the call stops. That's what I told you. Kane turned and ran back into the cave system. The gentle reminder was so close. How long did he have? Three minutes? He reached the shaft and hurried down between the gleaming pink ledges. Twice he almost fell. Stones skittered out under his feet. He jumped the last of the way. The scythe was where he had left it. Change of heart. Time to reflect. Shut up, Kane said and grabbed it. It took him a second to pull it free. As it came into his grasp, he saw it blink. An eye opened at the base of a blade, a pink fire that burned his retinas and gazed into his heart like... He saw silence. He saw the vast well of time. He saw a moment stretched into an eternity. He saw lingering stillness and glacial quiet. He saw dark stars and black suns frozen in a void of endless shadow. He saw monstrous, silent deities lurking in a corrupted cosmos. He heard a name, breathed like a sigh. Past. And he knew that it was his name now, too. The Emperor will demand a report, said Captain Vasur nervously. A, a detailed report? I'm, I'm not sure what to say. Kane looked up from his window seat. The rasping light of sling space beyond the window ports cast strange shadows in the chamber around them. Again, this is cinematic. It's quite good. <laughs> like, the rasping light of sling space. At the opening of the story, sling space is described as these, as these colorful, wonderful streaks running past the window. Some, something that's quite pretty. Something that's quite nice and colorful. Now... The rasping light of sling space beyond the window ports cast strange shadows in the chamber around them, right? So now it's being used to set a completely different mood. <clears throat> I'm compiling it now, Captain. It will be full and frank, but confidential. The mutiny on Ionan and the subsequent destruction of the gentle reminder must be kept quiet. For reasons of morale, I'm sure you understand. Yes, sir, said Wasur. Anything else? Wasur shook her head. We are en route back to the Locus Amata as ordered. Maximum sling speed. And the prisoners? Secure. Ready for transport to detention and interrogation as soon as we arrive. I'm sure we can get a lot out of them. Useful information on covert Templar activity across the sector. Take particular care of the girl, Kane replied. The one named Sona. I will deal with her personally. She is, I believe, especially valuable. Yes, sir, said Basur. The captain saluted and left Kane's quarters. What will you tell them? What I want to tell them. Good. What will you tell me? Everything. Good. What do you want? Well, perhaps I won't tell you that. No, I will. Trust is the essential foundation of any relationship, Kane. And I want... Kane flung himself to the side. Even by the standards of his agility, he was a blur. No longer anything that might be described as human. Kilo's axe splintered through the empty window seat. The scythe flashed. The severed halves of the old battered fight mech crashed to the deck and lay there, sparking and twitching as the light in his optics died. Surprise, said Kane. Oh boy, an hour and a half so far. In fact, an hour and 40 minutes almost to get here. Like I said, by the tail end of the story, I really I really didn't have a lot less to say, left to say about what the story was doing and how it was working. Um, something I really like is, as I said early on in the video, you may have forgotten by now because it was literally over an hour ago. In the beginning of the story, we get this setup to Kane's relationship with Kilo. This setup of, of like an old man and a young nephew, or even a son, perhaps. Like a somewhat paternal relationship between him and the robot. And certainly one that is emotionally quite close. Some, it, it's, a, it's a relationship that Kane clearly values early on in the story. By the end of it, he kills him and jokes about it. Brutally. Instantly. No talking, no anything, no goodbye. He just kills him outright. And this is the same thing we get here. Cain, throughout most of the story, demonstrates very clearly that the thing he cares about above all else is his duty. Like, whatever whatever his misgivings about the Empire, whatever anything else that's going on, Cain is not someone who kills people that he cares about relentlessly. As, as indeed we see, in his fight with Nakur, he keeps... Nakuri, he tr keeps trying to get Nakuri to put down his weapons 
and walk away because he understands what's going on. He knows that they're being manipulated. He knows that that weapon has created this situation, that it's mind controlling people somehow. He, he tries to resist it. He understands what's going on. But Rost manages to engineer a situation where he has no choice but picking him up. That's what happens at the end of the story is Rost has extended his call to the entire gentle reminder, that giant warship, all of them, all of the people on board have been told what the soldiers in the cave were told, that you've been chosen. All you need to do is kill Cain and I will be yours. So, Cain, so Rost engineers a situation where the only way for Cain to survive, and indeed the only way for him to stop what Rost is doing to other people around it, is to pick him up. He's in a no-win situation, and the thing he ha he does when he picks it up is he trusts for a moment. He, he thinks, okay, I can pick it up, I can resist it, I can manage it, but... He knew. Rost. He knew it was his name now, too. Cain dies in that moment. The moment he picks up Rost, the Cain character, the character of Cain that we have known so far in the story, is dead gone forever. The mercy that he has demonstrated towards even people who tried to kill him is gone. The sort of affable, charming personality that he had is gone. His his concern for his duty, his concern for his emperor, his concern for the empire, gone like that. The moment he picked up Rast, he was lost. And that is a quite, quite a different story than the one that's being told in the base game where, where Kane and Rast have this equal relationship here. No, no. The moment Cain touches Rost, it's over. He's gone. And there is a loss there. There's a tragedy to him that even before Rost fully takes him over, if indeed that's what happens at the end of his story, he's already gone. Like, the power has already corrupted him. The thing has already taken away most of what made him who he was. And that, to me, like, I was surprised by the subtlety of that. Well, it's not, it's not super subtle, but nonetheless, like, as, as a narrative structure... That's actually really subtle. Like, that's actually really, really quite a clever way to do that. Uh, to, to set up this relationship early on, and then by the end, have him brutally destroy that relationship without a hint of regret. As sort of a symbol of, of, of the person that he's become, but also spending so much time over the course of the story to make sure that we understand that Cain cares about his duty above all else. Until, until, until. Now, I've praised this story plenty. I've nitpicked it plenty. Generally, I really like it. I really like this as a setup to a good, tragic villain. Like, Kane is, is set up to be a really good, sort of, where, where he's not really a badass so much as he's this tragic corruption that you just kind of see unfold in front of you where the person he once was progressively falls away more and more and more and you get to see nothing but monstrousness left left behind like someone who's infected with a terrible you know wasting disease or something it's it's quite grim and the thing it reminds me of weirdly if you remember the uh, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies from 2000 and the the one from 2001 the first one where Norman Osborn becomes the green goblin that's uh, Willem Dafoe giving a fantastic turn in that movie the thing that's interesting about that version of the Green Goblin is, like, Willem Dafoe is a, is a businessman, an ambitious man, a, a scientific genius who gets ousted from his company, and in a desperation move to maintain control of his company, he uses some performance-enhancing drugs on himself that he's testing for use with the military, and they do to him essentially what Rost does to Kane here. They destroy the man he once was. They take all of his qualities, good and bad, and just turn them way the hell up to 11. And it's not, it's not a case of, oh, Cain was always evil. He was always evil, he just needed the weapon to kind of push him over the edge. That really isn't the case with him, is that he's a man who's compromised, who has compromised morality, but who still, like, there is a moral core to him, there's a personal core to him, there's a personality there that is consistent. His, his dedication to duty, his dedication to his comrades, like, his dedication to the Empire, and this relationship he has with, like, the fight mech and relationship that he cultivates, that he has to kill multiple people with whom he has cultivated relationships over the course of the story, and he doesn't like doing it at all. Until... That. Until Rast, right? And for a story that's, that's written 
for like a skin line inside of a video game. That's that's some surprisingly hefty stuff to kind of bring in there, like to, to show the corruption of power, not as a thing, because that's that's the trope, right? Is that when you when you have a story about oh power corrupts, the guy who's being corrupted was always kind of corrupt to begin with, right? It was, it was always a case more of of someone who was already kind of evil finding the evil artifact, and then they just get taken over by the evil artifact. And aha, if you if you act evil, then you'll be taken over. But here it's it's completely different. Kane, at least according to him, is acting morally throughout the whole story he's doing his duty his duty involves doing immoral completely terrible things like murder but from his perspective he's always aiming very straight and very true at upholding a moral and ethical standard that applies to him and his profession that applies to his personal moral code right so he's not someone who was always amoral who was always willing to betray his principles who was always willing like to to be corrupted at the drop of a hat he's someone who really shouldn't be corruptible but then it happens anyway because he comes into contact with enormous power and enormous power will take even someone who is trying to be a very good person and turn them into something terrible evil and ugly and that to me is kind of interesting. Now, of course, the trouble with this story, like all of League of Legends lore, especially the skin lore, is that Riot has a bit of a tendency to put this stuff out there and get us all very excited for it. And then that's it. That's all we get. They never follow up on it ever. I'm thinking in particular of the project skins and the program skins. We'd had this whole extended lore universe kind of set up in their background. And then with just nothing, fucking nothing. There's been nothing since the lore skins were, since the project skins were released. They get stuff on their skin release, and then they get absolutely bugger all later on down the line. And that happened as well with the Star Guardians. Like, there's only really been, to my knowledge, Star Guardian content released in conjunction with Star Guardian skins. And the problem with that is that that means that every single time there's new lore content for the Star Guardians, it's because some more people have been turned into Star Guardians. And so it's always about introducing new characters. It's never about following up on older storylines. And that's the thing I worry about here is that if we get more lore for the Odyssey universe, it's going to be in conjunction with new skin releases. And so all of the lore content that we're going to get for the Odyssey universe, it's going to be about introducing these new characters, introducing these new skins, which is just not going to be satisfying because it's not going to build on a storyline. It's not going to it's not going to take us to any kind of a conclusion. Now, this story, the good thing about this short story is that it's self-contained. It's finished. This is a mini story. It's the first arc of Kane's development as a character, like the first arc of him going from compromised but not, uh, nonetheless principled Imperial officer to raving murderous madman chasing down the crew of the Odyssey trying to recover Sona because he needs her to open the Aura Gate or whatever the hell the case may be. And it's quite good that it finishes that early, that first storyline. It finishes explaining to us how he becomes that single-minded, insane assassin. That's quite good. I quite like that. Like, that, that's a good way to do it, but Riot, just please follow up on it. Like, please do this properly. Please, if you're gonna create a, a cinematic or a a skin story universe as as complicated as this please follow up on it anyway i quite desperately need to go to the bathroom so we're gonna cut this video right here if you've enjoyed this good lord closing in on two hours of me breaking down a lore story sorry for the burp for league of legends sci-fi fantasy skin then there's a like button you can also subscribe to the channel you can also not do that if you want to. there's a patreon i have that you can support uh, if you want to. And I really want to make up a story about the dislike button, but I really desperately need to go to the bathroom, so thank you very much for watching, everybody. Ah! <laughs>